let's start with <clears throat> interventions now. So let's um, prioritize. So airway first, inhalation injury. It's simply intubation. The important thing here is to intubate early. Uh, do you think we can still intubate the patient if the airway is already closing? No. All right, so <clears throat> at the moment you suspect <clears throat> that there is inhalation injury, the signs are here. So besides the x-ray, uh, right here. So if the patient has inhalation injury, you'll see hoarseness, anxiety, confusion, plus of course the obvious signs that <clears throat> the um, the patient has burnt facial hair, singed nasal hair, um, you have facial burns, because of course you assume that the patient has inhalation injury if those all of those are seen. So if the neck was burnt or the upper chest was burnt, <clears throat> or the patient was burnt in a closed space, let's say a small apartment, or a an enclosed factory, for instance, or um, warehouse, where in there is a poorly ventilated area. So those are all indications that the patient may have <clears throat> um, inhalation injury. They're summarized here in box 51-5. CO poisoning. I won't test the level like this one, table 51.2. These are the um, specific to the carbon monoxide po uh, poisoning. The only thing here is how does the patient look like? So that will be my only question on the exam. How do you know that the patient has sustained a carbon monoxide poisoning? How does the patient look? So the manifestations are here. All right. So you suspect carbon monoxide poisoning if the patient, especially the color, they actually look cherry red, <clears throat> especially your, uh, this is referring, of course, to your mucous membrane. It, your skin can't be cherry red. It's the, um, the, the mucous membrane. So the remember that between CO, which is carbon monoxide, and CO2 and oxygen, the difference there is only one molecule. So really, the hemoglobin here cannot really distinguish what am I carrying? Am I carrying CO, CO2, or oxygen? All the hemoglobin knows is I'm carrying a couple of uh, molecules, okay? So between oxygen and carbon monoxide, which one will be lighter <clears throat> according to the periodic table of elements? Oxygen, which is two, has two molecules, or carbon and oxygen, which is also two molecules. However, on the periodic table of elements, which one is lighter? Carbon, carbon? carbon was CO. listed above oxygen, right? So mm -hmm. between oxygen and carbon monoxide, hemoglobin actually has a higher affinity for carbon monoxide. So if both are available, hemoglobin would rather carry carbon monoxide. <laughs> so you can't really tell. Plus, the uh, Carbon monoxide has, you know, has still has a molecule of oxygen, so you won't see cyanosis here. That's one thing in um, CO. You, you, the patient doesn't become cyanotic if they have CO poisoning. In fact, you've heard of stories when people uh, die from this, either accidentally or intentionally. Um, it's a peaceful death, right? I mean, you've seen accidents wherein the carbon monoxide detector wasn't working. The patients just fell asleep. They fell asleep and then uh, can't wake up. So you have here that um, here the, the um, number one symptom is headache confusion. And then the patient, of course, isn't aware that they're confused. And then all they'll do is just, all right, I'm, I'm drowsy. I go to sleep. With the patients with either injury above or below the glottis, there will still be swelling of the airway. So this is the reason why we have to intubate early 
uh, especially if you already hear the um, signs of uh, respiratory distress, let's say wheezing or uh, stridor. Those are sounds that indicate the airway is closing. So you have to intubate now um, because later, if you wait another couple hours, you may not be able to intubate anymore. Then we we'll have to do a tracheostomy at that point. So summary for your inhalation injury. These are your signs and symptoms indicating the patient sustained inhalation injury, including smoke inhalation, which is carbon monoxide. And here are your interventions. Again, monitor lung sounds that indicate the patient may need to be intubated. Okay, and again, don't wait too long for uh, intubation. Here, delaying intubation may result in edema, and then now you can't intubate anymore. The laryngoscope just won't go in anymore. <clears throat> Let's proceed with um, electrical injury management. So the patient obviously uh, will have to be removed from the source of the electricity, right? So however you do that, either you turn the power off or um, push the patient, touch the patient with a non-conducting um, material to separate the patient from the source of electricity. As I mentioned earlier, grad masquerader because again, the, the it's like a, an iceberg, okay? The, the concept of an iceberg. When you see an iceberg, you're only seeing the tip of an iceberg. The the ninety percent or more mass of the iceberg is underwater. So the same thing here as in electrical injuries. So the the wound you see, which are the entrance and exit points, are only the tip of the iceberg. So your most of your injury is in turn. So here are examples. So this is the contact with the electricity. Um, again, our priority here is the um, damage to the um, internal organs, especially the heart. These arrhythmias are not uncommon with uh, electrical burns. So let's go now to fluid resuscitation. Our standard formula is the Parkland. Parkland is, where's the formula? Uh, let's get to that later. Um, I guess they just mentioned Parkland here. All right, so the burnt tissue will involve muscles as well. So once we have muscles involved, there will be, of course, myoglobinuria. And these are large molecules secreted by injured skeletal muscles. So they will flood your bloodstream with that and then end up damaging the kidneys. Sign of that is red or tea-colored urine, indicating there is um, clogging or some degree of bleeding inside the kidney. And like I said, if you remember from um, NUR 241 under acute kidney injury, this is what type of <clears throat> um, AKI cost is this pre renal, intra, or post renal? Myoglobin. This can also result from. Would it be pre renal? Rhabdo. Uh, pre renal is <clears throat> any condition that results in low perfusion to the kidney, low blood flow. Uh, so, would it be intra renal? Okay, this one would be intrarenal. So myoglobinuria is now the presence of myoglobin, which again is released by injured or in this case burnt uh, skeletal muscles, uh, will now clog your kidneys, causing acute tubular necrosis. That means nephrons die, leading to acute kidney injury. Now for circumferential burns, <clears throat> for instance, let's look at this arm. This doesn't look so bad, but imagine, uh, you know what? The big, bigger example is this um, patient up here. <clears throat> All right, look at this patient. And then imagine this is an arm. 
Okay, look at how swollen this patient's face is. I'm sure this patient didn't look like this uh, yesterday. So as the patient gets worse though, um, which is again during the 24 to 36 hours after the burn, because now you have the ca increased capillary membrane permeability and the massive vasodilation, the leaking of the fluids <coughs> uh, from the capillaries, they become more and more edematous. So imagine this is not the head, this is the arm. So the arm here will be very, very swollen. Okay, severe, and then it's it involves the entire circumference of the arm. Does that remind you of anything? In a previous semester? Can that lead to compartment syndrome? Mm -hmm. Yes, so if you have a circumferential burn, meaning the whole circumference of the arm was burned, <coughs> It'd be different if it's only one side. If it's one side, then you'll probably have edema, but not the entire arm, only one side of the arm. But if you burn an entire extremity, then there will be a circumferential swelling also. So as the edema gets worse, caused again by the increased capillary membrane permeability, so fluids will leak out. And then the, the skin here is obviously um, burnt, right? So especially if you have um, crispy skin, meaning is this crispy skin still very flexible? No. Can it can it um, expand like my my like my belly? No. No. Because no. now the skin is very leathery. It's very tough. It's not flexible. So therefore, it will act like a tourniquet. And once you have that it now develops compartment syndrome. And then now you have the six piece coming up, <clears throat> six piece starting with the pallor. There will be extreme pain, which is un unrelieved by opioids. Then you have pressure, paralysis, paresthesia, and pressure. So watch out for uh, compartment syndrome. And of course, you know, compartment syndrome is a surgical emergency. Chemical injuries. <clears throat> so here is uh, an example. So we don't know if this is an acid burn or an alkali burn. The important thing here is to, while caring for the patient, protect yourself from exposure. Uh, make sure you have PPE, you know, especially gloves and gown so that you don't get burned yourself. I won't test you about the antidote because we don't know uh, what the antidote is and neither is it mentioned here. <clears throat> Meaning the, the, uh, the, the, the treatment will involve neutralization of the acid or the uh, alkali <clears throat> involved. However, the first thing again, as I mentioned before the break during the first session was the, the chemical must be removed from the skin because, or the clothing removed that if it was saturated with a chemical. Because as long as the chemical remains in contact with the skin, the burning process will continue. So here, even if it says irrigate with copious amounts of water, we don't know if it's safe to do that. All right, so maybe the chemical could have a reaction with water, so we don't know. So the basic um, principle involved here is you have to know what the chemical is. What is that? Um, as far as removing clothing, of course, the only safe action to do that if, if the clothing is not stuck to the skin, right? Because sometimes when you get burned, the, um, the clothing is also melted and it may end up sticking to the skin. So if it's stuck, then don't rip it off because it's not like uh, ripping off a band-aid. Now you'll also rip off the skin. Escarotomy, this is the management of... Professor, question. Yeah. Uh -huh. But then how will we remove it? Like if we need to remove this chemical, what's our action? Do we remove it or we just leave it the way it is? That's uh, an example of I don't have an answer for and the textbook did not provide us with information. That's why that's what I just said. 
I won't okay. ask that because that information is not provided for us. Because first of all, it's specific to the chemical. And um, we don't know how water or other uh, substances we, which we usually use in the hospital will react with that chemical. Okay, thank you. So escarotomies and fasciotomy, this obviously is the surgical man management of the circumferential burn. So to manage compartment syndrome, we do either an escarotomy, which is you just, the doctor makes an incision to open the, the chicharron, the, the really crispy skin. And fasciotomy, if necessary, he'll, he'll cut all the way to the muscle to, the, to open the fascia and then relieve the pressure to restore circulation. Um, there should be some pictures here. Uh, this one, I'm not testing 51.3 because this is now um, involving specific cleaners. I mean, this is not nursing. Here is a uh, escarotomy. Okay, so you can see the extreme sw swelling here of the arm. So again, this acts like a tourniquet now. So there is no more uh, circulation to the skin. That's why the I mean to the tissue to the arm. That's why the six piece appear, and this is the only surgical intervention, uh, emergency to relieve pressure, thereby restoring blood flow. Escarotomies can also be performed on the torso because the same thing. If the entire chest is burnt to a crisp, that will impair chest expansion, so the patient can't breathe. So. It can also be done on um, chest burns. And we don't need to know where exactly to cut because we're not doing the cutting anyway. Okay, so the emergent phase is the first 24 to 36 hours of the burn. Our priorities again is airway and circulation. So our goal here is to just keep this patient alive until the increased capillary capillary membrane permeability stops. Okay, so that the the fluid loss also stops. We'll skip through the uh, airway because we already did the um, first aid, and then again for airway management, we'll do that in another module. Let's go to circulation now. So this is using the Parkland formula. Recall all the pictures you saw. Is it easy to start an IV site on this patient? No. Extremely difficult. So most of the time, these patients will have a central line. The doctor will have to insert a central line. Plus the, the massive amount of fluid we're giving here is not going to um, go through a peripheral IV. Okay, so even if you have a big peripheral IV uh, knee, um, catheter, meaning if you manage to get that in, look at the. Let's do the calculation now. Of how much fluid we're we're giving this patient? So the universal formula is four mL per kilogram per TBSA. So meaning you have to multiply four times the patient's weight in kilogram times the TBSA. When it comes to the TBSA, since this is in percentage, do not convert the percentage to a decimal. Just keep it at the at that number. Meaning, who did we burn earlier? Giselle, right? So Giselle's um, TBSA was 50.5. Do not change it to 0 0.505, clear? Just keep it at 50.5. So please calculate Miss Giselle's, the, the quadriplegic Giselle, uh, who weighs 60 kilograms. So the paraplegic, I mean quadriplegic Giselle that we burned earlier was is, is weighing 60 kilograms. And her TBSA as calculated was 50.5 and then times 4. What do you got? 
12,120. Very good. Now, how are we going to give 12,120? Do we dump it down like a uh, rainfall? No. 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 For <laughs> okay, so we will give that for over 24 hours. How it's given is half of that will have to be given during the first eight hours post burn. So, Giselle was burned, let's say, at 8 a.m. When she gets to the hospital, do we have eight hours? No, we count from the time she was burned, right? Right, okay. Yeah. So, unless you burn somebody in the hospital, there will never be a burn patient that has eight hours from the time they got, you know, I mean... When they reach the hospital, they've already lost time, correct? Unless we really schedule the burn. So let's say right now we admit um, Priscilla. Okay, we admit Priscilla in the hospital. We're ready with the IV sites and everything. And then we'll douse her with, with gasoline and then light her up. Then that's the only time we have exactly eight hours, right? Because we did the burning right there. However, that's not what's going to happen. Accidents happen, the burn injury occurs outside the hospital. So from the time we put the fire out, we stabilized her airway, put her on the bus, and then take her to the hospital. We've lost time, correct? Yeah. Okay. So the 12,120 ml, which is half, I mean, the entire fluid is going to receive during the first 24 hours. Half of that is how much? 6,060, correct? So the 6,060 volume, um, how many mls per hour will we run this thing on IV pump if she reaches the hospital at 10 a.m.? She got burned at 8. She reached the hospital. Six at hours. 10. So we have six hours to infuse 6,060. So 6,060 divided by six hours equals how many mLs per hour? 1,010, correct? No, 1,001. Am I correct? No, I was correct the first time. Wait, no. 1,010 mLs per hour. Yeah. Yeah? Am I correct? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right, so the first six hours this time, because we don't have eight, so we have to run the IV fluid at 1,010 mLs per hour for the first well, technically, it's now six hours, all right? Because we have six hours to infuse half of it because we lost two hours already. Because um, because according to this, this must be given eight hours post-burn, not eight hours from arrival to the healthcare facility. Does that make sense? Because really, when did Giselle start losing fluid? Did she start losing it when she got to the hospital? No, 8 a.m. Wednesday. Right, she, she started losing them as soon as she got burned. So what do we do now with the other half, the other 6,060? Give over the next 16 hours. All right. That's pretty clear, right? Any question on that? And you have the example here. Okay, so please read this example if you have... A question. I, I, I actually gave the same example. All right? Okay. Okay. Now, is the Parkland formula perfect, though? 4 ml per kilogram per TBSA. Is that perfect? Probably not because... Most probably not. Because do we know the patient's exact weight? No. 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 Because even if we weigh the patient when they get to the ER, is that weight accurate? No. Because they are no. Not that is not her dry weight, right? Because that is a weight of somebody who is already starting to have edema. Mm -hmm. Remember, when you have edema or specifically third spacing, 
the water in the interstitial compartment doesn't technically count because it's not inside the cell nor is it inside the bloodstream meaning you lost that it's, it's as good as you lost it however it didn't leave the body though. so therefore that that water that is now third spacing in the interstitial space causing the edema is added to the weight which is of course not accurate anymore does that make sense yes okay based on that knowledge that you you know that this is not a accurate weight so this fluid we're giving is not actually adequate so what is our basis to know that are we giving enough fluid to giselle we don't know well what does it urine say? output okay no? so the most reliable indicator of adequate fluid resuscitation is her urine output so Giselle has to receive a Foley. That's why burn patients must have a Foley so we can monitor hourly urine output. So if she makes at least 0.5 mLs per kilogram per hour of urine, is she getting enough fluids? Yes. 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 Okay, so 0.5 mL, you multiply that by her weight, which is 60, that's 30 mLs per hour, right? So at least it should be 0 0.5 mLs per kilogram per hour, uh, per hour. However, it tells you here that if myoglobin is present, meaning what will myoglobin do to the kidney? Back to the kidney. It will kill, the, yeah, it will destroy the kidney. If you remember earlier, acute tubular necrosis, so it will kill nephrons. You need a more, a higher urine output. Instead of 0 0.5, you need it at 1 ml per kilogram per hour. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So throughout this... Okay, look at yeah. Can you just go over that again, like the last statement you made? I just... Which part? With the urine output 0.5 milligram per hour. Oh, okay. All right. So uh, going back again, since we're not basing the formula on an accurate weight it is a a guesstimate okay, even though we weigh the patient we know what they exactly weigh that weight is not accurate that weight is a, not the dry weight this that is a weight of a patient who has edema who has water inside them which doesn't really count in any body function okay it's just like the patient lost that water but the water remained in the body. Okay, it's it's somewhere where it's like um, weighing somebody wherein you're carrying a a um, a five gallon jug of, of water. Does that does that help? Meaning you got on the scale, then you were carrying a separate jug containing fluid. Got it. Okay, it's the same thing as that. Meaning, is that water that you're carrying in the jug of water inside you? No. No. Okay, so it's like that. So the patient has water somewhere in the body distributed all over, which doesn't really have any um, participation or role in the fluid balance because you, you technically lost that water already. Okay, because it's not in the bloodstream, it's not in the cell. And they're not going to go back there until the ca increased capillary membrane permeability stops. Okay? Yes. So, if the, so, therefore, even if we do the Parkland formula accurately, our basis for evaluating whether or not the fluid resuscitation is enough is going to have to be the early urine output which under normal circumstances must be at least 0 0.5 mLs per kilogram per hour right. or if the patient has myoglobin in the urine then we want it higher we want it double 1 mL per kilogram per hour all right got it so okay. then myoglobin is that a good thing or a bad thing in this a bad thing that's bad that will cause acute kidney injury because again these are Necrosis. Signs of yeah, this is these are signs of skeletal muscle injury. If you remember in 
that was also present in a patient after an MI on top right. of CKMB. Yeah, they also had myoglobin, right, in the urine. So same thing, it causes acute tubular necrosis causing AKI. Now, uh, because the patient is severely edematous here, it would make sense that we give diuretics, right, to decrease, you know, to to get rid yeah. of that edema. Yeah. Yeah, but right. here, no, diuretics should not be given because really, will that help with the edema? Because remember, the edema here is because it's of the wrong. increased capillary per membrane permeability. So even if you give diuretics, it's not really going to do anything to those fluids that are in the interstitial space. Yeah. In fact, the fluid that it will be eliminated is the fluid that's already in the bloodstream. So will it help or worsen the shock? It will worsen. It will worsen. worsen it. Right. Because the, the diuretics don't, won't go, won't, aren't going to pull that water off. Even let's say you use mannitol, which is an osmotic diuretic, the patient here is not stable enough to, to receive diuretics. Okay, we our priority here is really to increase blood volume because look what happens. If you even if you're giving this, the fluid here, by the way, is normal saline. So even if you're giving normal saline at what is this, 1010 ml per hour. Are all of this fluid going to stay in the bloodstream? No. No, because remember, during the eight, first 8 to 36 hours, what's happening to the blood vessels? To the capillary yeah. membrane permeability? Yeah, it's increased, right? Yeah. So are all of these saline that you're giving at 1,010 mLs per hour going to stay in the bloodstream? No. no. Where is it going to go? It's going to go into the interstitial space. It will mostly go into the interstitial space. So you might say, well, what's the use then? Why are we keep giving this? Well, if we don't put it in there, then we'll never have adequate blood pressure. The patient's dead either way. So you have to give. You have no choice. You have to give this water, even though with the knowledge that most of that's going to actually make the edema worse. But we have no choice. The blood pressure must be maintained okay don't worry this will all go away anyway as long as we keep this patient alive long enough to reach the next phase okay okay all right so here's an example um again these are your indicators so you watch the patient uh closely to make sure is our blood uh, blood uh, replacement adequate so you monitor all of these here, especially urine output. Okay, those are very important. And as we already uh, learned from shock, we need our mean arterial pressure at at least 65, which is uh, systolic greater than 100. All righty, let's go to uh, diagnostic studies. We draw, uh, because remember this patient is in severe injury. This patient also goes into DIC. If you remember from last semester, one of the causes of DIC was burns, correct? Whichever group presented DIC last semester? Yes. One of the causes of DIC was burn. So you monitor these, um, you know, your uh, platelets and your bleeding times, INR, PT, PTT, okay, to monitor for that complication. Uh, of course, we do the um, warming uh, equipment, you know, blankets, thermal blankets, or uh, warming blankets. Wound care is begun. Uh, we'll do wound care shortly. Uh, we'll need to know how to do wound care because this was this is just a uh, introduction. Uh, because wound, as stated here, wound care is not really your priority during the first 24 to 36 hours. Although we begin, we begin wound care, but that's not your priority. We have other problems to worry about. We have airway and um, circulation to worry about. And here are the changes which we did on the first few pages of the chapter. 
Uh, pain management, of course, uh, begins on the emergent phase. Please don't forget pain, even if, especially if the patient's already intubated, because they can't say that they're in pain, but we assume they're in severe pain. Alrighty, so let's proceed with. Uh, these are. Look at your pain medication. Do you see anything PO there? No. Oh, uh, yeah, we do have methadone, but. Uh, of course, if the patient is still unconscious, then our preferred is the IV. Uh, plus, you know, the GI tract is, um, has paralytic ileus, right? So absorption of the PO meds will be slow. So pain pills will take a long time before they work. Plus, the kidneys, uh, remember, have uh, some kidney injury. So be careful also with how often you're medication, medicating these patients. The others, of course, this is a stressful event. They must receive prophylactic PPIs or H2 receptor blockers to prevent stress ulcers. Uh, don't forget to feed the patient. And yeah, they're also at risk for blood uh, clots, definitely, because they're immobile. And that's it. Let's go straight now to wound care. So the patient survived the um, emergent phase. So they stayed alive. So they reached 48 to 72 hours now. Yay, patients alive. So at this point, the fluids are already decreased. We're just maintaining the uh, fluid trans uh, infusion but not at 1,000 ml per hour rates anymore. For wound care, although we use sterile technique, these wounds are not sterile, obviously. You have massive size wounds here, so it's impossible to keep them sterile. However, we use sterile technique, that way we don't contaminate the wound. Uh, but just remember, this is not an incision, okay? This is not a clean wound. These are dirty. These are very dirty wounds. Um, so one option is hydrotherapy. Unlike before, wherein we emerge the whole body right here, total immersion of the body into a tank, that's not done anymore because they've discovered that this actually contributes to contamination, cross-contamination of wounds because maybe only one wound is um, infected and then be because you put them in a tub, now the infection is all over now. So they do, um, they still do hydrotherapy, but they now emerge, I mean submerge one body part at a time. That way we don't have any cross contamination. As far as wound care, well, they do hydrotherapy because they do physical therapy at the same time. So therefore, guess where hydrotherapy is done? What department? Burn it's, unit? No, no it's, it's in, yeah, this is in the physical therapy department. Okay, so the hydrotherapy is done in the PT department. This is not on the nursing floor. So patients taken by physical therapy to the physical therapy department where they have these pumps. Okay, they have these pools. So the this is um, like a jacuzzi. So they'll have whirlpool uh, in the tub to loosen the, you know, to gently loosen the dead tissue, the scar from the wound. And then after that, then we do wound care. Um, it's also a good timing while they're in the hydrotherapy so they can move the affected arm or leg that was burned. So it, it's easier when you do it during um, hydrotherapy. So two birds at one time, uh, two birds with one stone. Wound care. So we, I will only test sylvadine and collagenase, uh, which should be somewhere here. Uh, Where's the enzymatic? This one here. Oh, here. Never mind. Table 51.7. Um, where's collagenase? Right here. So enzymatic cream. 
this one, study this. These are your information. Uh, this is a debreeding enzyme, meaning this will remove dead tissue. So guess where you apply it on? On dead tissue. Okay, because again, it will break down. This is an enzyme. This is the debreeding enzyme. Um, you only apply it on SCAR. Okay, so here it will help penetrate and soften SCAR for debridement. One thing though is do not put it on granulation tissue because what will it do to granulation tissue? Break down the granulation it tissue. It will break it down. So try not to put it there. So that one and, and silvadine, this one. So it has two products in there, silver, which has an antibacterial, it has a bacteriostatic property, meaning it will prevent bacterial growth, and then it has a sulfa antibiotic. This is routinely given, okay, not as needed. Unlike a systemic antibiotic, you know, let's say penicillin or an IV antibiotic, where it's systemic and given only if you have an infection this one whether or not the burn wound is infected you apply this every single day a uh, nice effect is it's cooling and of course um, the important thing there is the um, antibacterial antibacterial and bacteriostatic so perfect so you, we don't want anything growing there because remember the wound is exposed to air and you do have normal flora on the skin right normally we have bacteria on the skin anyway but as long as they stay on the skin they're harmless however this patient doesn't have skin in areas of burn so what will those good bacteria do if your skin is missing attack the body it cause infection. It, they're not good bacteria anymore they turn bad and cause infections so only two, okay, table 51.7, I'm just testing silver, silverdine, and collagenase. That's it. Wound care. The important thing here is not, I mentioned again earlier, no cost contamination. So the important thing here is to work on one body part at a time. Doesn't mean that this is the same patient anyway, that you do the same thing for the same equipment for all body parts. No. Use a different glove when you take care of one wound. Okay, especially if they're on separate extremities. Okay, so use one set of PPE here, another set of PPE for the other side. Clear? Clear. All right, do not cross contaminate. Again, each one is growing different organisms. Yes, ma'am. And if the person has like full body burns, that means that we have to change our PPE as we go down body parts or something yep. like that. Uh huh. Because oh. mm -hmm. again, do we assume that it's the same infection? No, no. No, protect the patient by changing PPEs. Um, besides, on a burn unit, not all patients are in um, private rooms. They have a burn wall, or they have four to eight beds in one ward. Those especially, so you definitely had to change PPE. You can't just use one PPE for all those patients. Okay. Uh, we'll skip the graphs. We're not testing graphs at all. Nope, nope, nope. Uh, pain management, no different. We did pain management last semester. Again, the principles are what route do you give? Forward. This is acute pain. So IV? PO, okay, IV. so you IV. use parenteral. IV only though. No IM, no sub Q because are the, you think the um, absorption is normal? No. On burnt areas, no. So do not give IM or sub Q. Look at this. You give an IM injection, there's no way that that medic pain medication is going to be absorbed. Okay, so here, recommended IV narcotics only. And especially when do we medicate? 
during dressing changes especially because that's the most painful time. Professor, is it during or before? Uh, well, of course you give, um, sorry, you administer it before, right? You're correct. But meaning, I'm trying to say they need pain medications for prior to dressing changes, right? Okay. So that it, uh, it's comfortable, they're comfortable. Especially the ripping off part. When you take off the old dressings, yikes. Okay. So they need uh, medication for that. Uh, we already did the um, infection prevention, so no cross-contamination. And that's it for burns. Uh, the recovery phase, I mean the rehab phase, will skip because this is years. The patient won't rehab in the hospital. They'll rehab at home to, or in a um, short-term rehab some someplace else. Because this will take long. Uh, sometimes the rehab, depending on the extent of your burns, maybe an okay. entire lifetime. No, the rest of their life, they'll be rehabbing. So not only physically, but uh, PTSD. Most patients, if it's severe, they may have PTSD after the injury. All right, contractures, and then I'll let you go. I'm not testing it, though. The... Um, there are positioning here. So this is contracture. So uh, um, contractures not only affect joints, but also skin. When the skin heals, it contracts, meaning it pulls. So if um, there's no tension on the, on the skin, it will contract. Contract meaning it will pull. So let's say... Uh, this neck, right? This patient had a burn on the neck. If this patient is maintained in flexion, so let's say he's, he has his head down because he's on his phone, right? He's on his iPad playing games after the burn injury, okay? Because so, it's boring. He sits in the hospital. If he keeps his neck flexed most of the day, when that tissue heals and scars, Will he be able to lift that neck? No. No, it will contract. So therefore, you will lose range of motion here. Uh, let me show you a picture. Okay, here. Uh, can you see this pictures? Yes. Can you see it? Yeah, okay. So this is an example of a contracture. So this patient obviously did not follow um, proper positioning of the um, body part. This is a contraction. This is now how the skin heals. So like I said, it will pull. It tends to pull as it scars. So look, the patient now has a deformity and they can't, I'm sure he can't look up anymore because he has lost a range of motion of the of the neck so to avoid this he should have been in a extended um, hyperextension position most of the time so when he sleeps there should be no pillow that way the the patient is forced to extend or hyperextend the neck so as the as the skin heals it will not form a contracture like this one so the principle is to stretch the body part so let me ask you so if the burn is on the anterior neck, what position do you put the patient in bed? Flexed. Hyperextension, right? So hyperextension of the neck. However, if the burn part is the back of the neck, what position do you put the patient? Flexed the neck. Prone? Flexed the neck. Again, the burn part is the back of the neck. What position do you put them to avoid Flexion. contractures? Flexion. Sorry? Flexion. Very good. Okay, so I burned my the back of my knee. Extension. 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 Very good. So the the basic rule is extending the body part, right? The exception, of course, is the back of the neck, because really if you extend it. 
then that will be flexion of the back of the neck, right? Yes. Yeah. If you think about it. So therefore, when you're flexing your neck down, you're actually extending the back of the neck. Does that make sense? Yes. Again, so right. if you get that question on the NCLEX, the, the principle is you want to stretch that body part. You want to put it in an extended position. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so... so um, yes. um, okay, uh, that's it for Burns. So next week's um, quiz will be on... Burns. All right, it's been nice knowing you. Um, <laughs> those who need to retake, please stay over. The rest of you, um, bye bye now. Thank you for flying Delta. <laughs> Goodbye, Professor. Bye now. Thank you. Uh, bye -bye. Professor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, can I ask you a question about the whole okay. part, please? Uh, what? Uh, about the Kaplan, the test that we're supposed to take. Can I ask you a question about those? The, uh, which Kaplan? Uh, the 50 questions that we're supposed to make, the quiz. And the weekly. Oh, yeah, yeah. go ahead. So what I wanted to know is you said that you would do it based on the remediation. I guess I'm a little confused about the remediation. So I only remediated the questions that I got wrong. Is that okay or do you want us to that's what you're supposed to do yeah only okay, limit. okay i just wanted to make sure that it's only the ones we got wrong yeah okay. mm -hmm. thank you so much okay bye bye, bye. bye. Sure. bye. Um, thank you professor bye. 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 yes i have a question uh -huh. um are you gonna put this video um this recording yes. on iTunes? Yeah. weekly yeah every week okay thank you all right uh, again, you need to retake the math. Just stay over the rest of you. Bye bye now. Goodbye. Thank Wait, you. Professor, I have a question. Yeah. One more about the Kaplan 50 question thing. Um, so I I did a couple of them, and the ones that I have left, uh, do you prefer like separate 50 question exams, or can I do one big of like a couple hundred? Does that count as multiple? Uh, if you want to do that to yourself, yeah, sure. Okay, got it. <laughs> I mean, that's long. I mean, a hundred, you're going to be, that's two hours at least. I know, but I'd rather just like sit and do it and get it out of the way. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right, again, the rest of you uh, can go. Just the people who need to take the math stay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye, Professor. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye bye now. <laughs> Professor. Thank you for. <laughs> I just have a quick question. What do you want? So, on the Kaplan, I got a question wrong in regards to anaphylactic shock. Um, the answer, I know obviously we do give epinephrine, but isn't epinephrine given IM? And it said that epinephrine was to be given sub Q. No. How do you give sub-Q heparin? I mean heparin or epi? No, no, epi, epi. It's I am. Okay, so I'm going to take a picture of that question because I got it wrong. Oh, well, don't blame <laughs> me. That's not my question. Go what give that to Kaplan. Kaplan's question, though. Yeah, send it to Kaplan. What do you want okay. from me? Well, I'm just letting you know that I didn't... That's not wrong. I'm not wrong. <laughs> yeah. Okay, no, I just want to make sure I know it's I am. It's not so cute. I don't know why they did that then. All right. Thanks, boss. Hey. Okay, bye. Bye. <laughs> How come there's still a lot of people left here? I only have a few for math. What's going on?
So are all eight of you supposed to be here? Hello? I'm here, I don't know. I don't know either. Yeah. What do we need My to question. Professor? Hello? Yeah. Yes. Hi. Yeah, so this is the math retake, right? Yes. What do we need to score? A hundred? Yeah, this is not okay, okay to kill one patient. Okay, no problem. All right. All your patients have the lid. Okay. Okay, let me know when you receive the test. Are you sending email? No, we're still doing it on ZipGrade, just like the first time. So you do it on ZipGrade, and then because there's no multiple choice, you, you write your answers on a piece of paper and then email it to me. No, no, I mean you send an email with the, to access to the ZipGrade, correct? Yes. Okay. Did it arrive yet? Not yet. Uh, no, 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 I don't have it yet either. No. Try again. Ah, oh, that's what I. to be a PDF. Okay, let's try it one more time. Let me email this to webmail so it's faster. Irina? Professor? So I have um, Iggy, Irina, Maureen, Ozen. Yes. Uh, and then Palyavi Raisa Sabine. Yes. Yes, Professor. Emis. Tamara. I'm here. Okay. Okay, let me count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. Wait a minute. Um, let me 
count off again. Uh, Irina? Yes. Iggy? Yes. Maureen? Here. Olivia? Here. Ozen? Here. Raisa? Sabine? Here. Tamara? Here. Raisa? So Raisa is not to be here. It's supposed to be here. Okay. Two, four, six, seven. All right. Uh, did you get the test? Nope. Nope. Oh, no, it's no. I think, yeah. Yes, now we did. All righty. Good luck. Thank you. Professor? Yeah? Hello. Uh, why am I taking it again? I got 100 last time. Who's this? Me too, Professor. Pallavi. Then why are you here? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, uh, guys, FYI, number eight, uh, I forgot to put there. It should be per dose, okay? How much will you give per dose? Number eight. Professor Scarda, how, how do you want us to write the answers? On a piece of paper or on an email? Okay.
Professor Scarda? Yeah, I got your email. Do I wait for you to create it or what do we do?
Professor, did you get my email? Professor? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I sent mine to. Me too. Hey guys, I'm just waiting for Maureen. The rest of you can go. Bye bye now. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, Professor. Goodbye. Sorry, I'm just taking picture. Take your time, Miss Maureen. I'm here till six o'clock. Uh, don't worry, it won't be until six. <laughs> <sighs>
Okay, uh, sorry, I just sent it. Bye. Thank you, Maureen. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.